This is Barbara Slavin from the Morse Institute Library. It's October 7th, 1999, and we're interviewing um, Arnie Lepisto as part of our Veterans Oral History Project. Good morning, Mr. Lepisto. Good morning. Uh, just for the record, what would you like me to call you? Arnie. And what is your first full first name? Arnold. Arnold. Okay. What is your address? Natick, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And your age? My age is 75. And your marital status? I'm married. Okay. Been married for 51 years. Wonderful. Any children? We have four children. The youngest is 42, the oldest is uh, 49. Mm -hmm. Any grandchildren? Two grandchildren. Uh, where were you born? I was born in uh, Coquero, Minnesota on a farm in 1924. And what was that like when, in those days, farm life? Oh, farm ride life was uh, rustic, of course. Uh, a lot of outdoor activity. And uh, when I was old enough, uh, which was about five or six, I was uh, milking cows. And I was uh, at eight or nine, I was out in the field uh, plowing and doing uh, farm work. Uh, when you when did you move to Natick? Moved to Natick in uh, September of 1968. And how did you happen to move to Natick? Uh, my job brought me here. I was working for uh, health, education, and welfare in the Chicago regional office, and uh, I got a promotion, so I came to Boston. And what is your family background? My parents were both born in uh, Finland. Uh, they came over to this country separately. They didn't know each other. Uh, they both came in 1913. My father was born in a place near Sala on the Russian border, also very close to the Arctic Circle. My mother was born in a place called near, near uh, Kemiarvi, and this was kind of in the middle of Finland, but again, very close to the Arctic Circle. Uh, when and where did you enter the military? Fort Stowing, Minnesota, December 2nd, 1942. And I was on reserve status for uh, the first uh, seven months, I believe. And what branch of the service were you in? It was Army Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose that branch? Well, I went to uh, Fort Stowing on that particular day, December 2nd, and I was uh, intent on uh, joining the Army Infantry because I had previous, uh, previously tried the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines and the Merchant Marines, and I had been rejected by all of these. I, I believe some of those uh, efforts were made when I was a junior in high school and then some of while I was a senior, and uh, because I had failed to get into any of those services, I was now destined, I thought, to go into the infantry. Mm -hmm. But when I got to Fort Stowing, I heard a voice uh, behind the desk, uh, and it was a first lieutenant from my hometown, from Coquero, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And he uh, said, Artie, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I came to join the infantry because all of my buddies were in the service, and he said, don't, don't join the infantry. He said, uh, uh, a lot of fellows get killed there. He said, why don't you try the Signal Corps? He said, I've been in the Signal Corps. They've treated me uh, very well, and uh, you would get some training. You'd have a skill, and that'd be far better, and, uh, and you'd be valuable in the whole uh, wire service. So. Uh, he said, there's a group down the hall just now uh, about ready to be uh, oriented, and then later on today, perhaps they will be sworn in. Why don't you join the group? So I joined the group, and uh, I got sworn in that day. Uh, you say you had trouble getting into some of the other services? Uh, yes, medically, they wouldn't uh, take me because I have very poor vision in, uh, in my left eye. 
and uh, in fact it's uh, uh, legally blind. I was born that way. So is it true that you would not have been drafted then had you uh, just done nothing? I could have avoided yeah. the draft uh, uh, very easily. The light uh, just swung over a little. Thank you. <laughs> now, could you tell me about your basic training? Well, after uh, first, uh, let me uh, describe the reserve status okay. I had in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, because when I got sworn in on December 2nd, 42, then I was told to uh, go home and I would hear from them and I would get assigned to uh, a radio repair course, and I did, and that started in early February of 1943, and it was uh, called radio repair trading. Part of it, the first part was mechanic learner. The second part was junior repair trainee. And that took me till July or August of 1943. Then I went into the uh, uh, active service. I got sent to Camp Kohler, California, mm -hmm. and that's where I had my basic training. What was basic training like? Uh, basic training uh, included uh, some lectures, but a lot of physical activity, uh, going through obstacle courses and uh, uh, whatnot. And I always enjoyed uh, the obstacle courses because they were competitive and I was uh, small and uh, could climb all the things we had to climb and take all the ropes and, uh, and run fast and that sort of thing. So I enjoyed that part. What were the lectures about? Uh, the lectures were on uh, many different facets of Army life to get us oriented to being uh, in the active military service. And then later on, uh, some of the lectures were about uh, the enemy, about the Japanese uh, people and the Japanese soldiers and about some of the foreign countries where you might uh, get sent. And where was your first duty station? My first duty station was uh, Camp Kohler, California for the basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, but are you asking? I mean the first uh, overseas station. Oh, the first yeah. overseas station. Uh, the first productive work <laughs> was uh, on the island of Biak. Mm -hmm. But before that, uh, I was uh, in Oro Bay, New Guinea. Uh, for a period of time, and uh, after the boat trip to get over to Oro Bay, uh, we were immediately put into training because by that time I was a radio operator, and I, I didn't get into the other training that I had prior to being uh, getting radio operator training, but uh, that's what I ended up doing overseas, and the first assignment was the island of Biak, north of uh, New Guinea. Actually, it's a part of New Guinea. Right. Could you tell me what the weather was like and the terrain was like? The weather was entirely different from what I had ever experienced in Minnesota. Uh, we were surrounded by jungle in Biak. We had uh, monsoon rains and uh, we, uh, uh, we had a lot of jungle, of course. We had a lot of coral, so the uh, landscape was certainly different. Uh, and uh, I, I can't associate Minnesota and New Guinea uh, with anything in common, really. They're very, very different. Were you, uh, were you adequately, were, you, were your clothes suitable for the climate? Well, we had big ponchos so that we were prepared for the rain, and uh, I did keep a diary for uh, a little over a month and uh, just reading it recently when uh, we decided on this assignment here, uh, I was flabbergasted as to how often it rained because practically every day I have an entry in the diary that it was raining and it was raining hard, it was blowing, and I even describe in there that uh, uh, one time I was hanging on for uh, dear life to my bunk so I wouldn't be blown out of the 
tent, but uh, and the rain blew in and uh, blew the flaps of the tent uh, away, and uh, sometimes you get all wet. Uh, and that particular time, uh, I, I had to get uh, find some dry pajamas and some dry uh, covers and. Uh, as far as the mattress, there weren't too many mattresses, so we just turned it over and slept on the other side. What was your work like as a radio operator in BIAC? What was your day like? We were uh, initially uh, working six hours on and six hours off, and uh, this was a uh, very difficult duty because when you had the off time, you had to get something to eat and then you try to get some sleep and uh, you just get to sleep and uh, somebody would be shaking you to get you back back up uh, working and so this went on for weeks and weeks because we didn't have enough uh, radio operators and I think we had shortages in the other areas uh, uh, also uh, so it was not a particularly enjoyable part it was uh, it was difficult work What, when you were on duty, what, what were you doing? Were you busy at work or you were waiting for messages to come in? It was uh, both sending and receiving of uh, messages. We used a uh, semi-automatic key most of the time when weather con conditions permitted. Once in a while we had a manual key, but when you use a manual key you can only send up to a speed of about 13 words a minute. Whereas with the semi-automatic key, when the weather was good, you could go 30, 35, even 40 words a minute and uh, get the message through more quickly. That was the motto of the Signal Corps, by the way, get the message through. Get the message so through. We were both sending uh, messages and receiving messages. Uh, and the messages, of course, had priorities. They were urgent and they were operational priority and they were uh, routine and they were deferred. Did now, you there, oh, now there were times when uh, 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 we had even more adverse conditions to uh, to work under. Uh, we had a few bombings and uh, at times like that uh, most of the time if we didn't have any urgent messages we could find uh, a secure place to be safe in the cliffs that were uh, on the shoreline uh, of the ocean. You could get into a cave in a cliff and be perfectly safe from uh, any, any bombings. But uh, if we had urgent messages to send through once in a while, we were told to uh, keep working. Mm -hmm. And in cases like that, they'd put the tent flaps down, put all the lights out, of course, and uh, throw a poncho over the radio operator and uh, with a flashlight, you'd be sending a message uh, to get it through. Could you tell me about the bombings? What were they like? Well, the bombings were uh, uh, fearful, of course, but uh, I, I felt some assurance that they weren't uh, necessarily right after us, because in our type of work, uh, it wasn't the radio operators or the message center or the code people necessarily uh, who they were after. They were they had uh, higher priority targets. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the airfield, uh, I should say airfields, because on the island of Biak, uh, they had three large, long airfields, and they were easy to construct uh, because it was this uh, hard coral and they could scrape that off and uh, level it off and uh, make an airfield uh, fairly quickly. And at a certain time of war when uh, they developed uh, the B-29, I don't know when that started really, but there was a C-29, which was a cargo plane that uh, took a long airstrip to land on. And uh, that was a million dollar plane, by the way. It was the first million dollar oh. plane that was ever built, I believe, right during World War II. But it had a long airstrip to uh, land on, and it would bring in a lot of supplies. And then there were always ships uh, around to take these supplies to wherever they had to go. Is to that the B-29 that you're referring to? The C-29. C-29. Okay. Cargo, uh, C standing for cargo, I believe. 
Did you have any kind of warning about the bombings, or did you just hear the bombs drop, or did you see the planes first? We never had too much warning, as, as I recall, and, and we didn't have a whole lot of uh, bombings. I think at the stage of the war, when I got to Biak, uh, uh, the war was already moving uh, northward. When I first got there, the pilot of the C-47 that I, uh, I was flying in uh, said to uh, get down in the plane. I don't think we had any seats even on the C-47, but to get down and, and you had your barracks bag, of course, to lean against uh, because uh, they did have small arms fire from uh, Japanese that were uh, bypassed in the jungle, but were, whatever ammunition they had, whatever guns they had, they'd try to use them uh, against us. I forgot to ask you what, uh, roughly what date was it when you were in Biak? Uh, roughly, it was about the end of uh, August, uh, the beginning of September uh, 1944, 1944, because I, when I went overseas, it was I left uh, San Francisco on June twenty uh, fifth, nineteen forty four. Did you ever see any Japanese face to face on Biak? Not on uh, Biak, but later on in Mindoro, I uh, saw three prisoners of war. One of them was an officer, and uh, uh, he was talking about being educated in the eastern part of the USA. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he was speaking in English? Yes, uh, yes he was. Did it do him any good? Well, I don't know. Uh, they were uh, fortunate to be prisoners rather than to be uh, mm -hmm. dead Japanese soldiers. Uh, during the whole war, uh, at least after the beginning of the war over there, we did not take too many prisoners, nor did the Japanese take many prisoners of uh, Americans. Uh, it was that uh, type of war that the Japanese would not surrender. It was against their nature, against their orders to surrender, even if the odds against them might be uh, uh, very, very negative in their favor. Uh, and I uh, thought of this recently when I was, uh, have been reading some books about World War II. In, uh, in Germany, uh, when the Germans uh, knew that they were surrounded and outmanned, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds would, uh, would surrender. I never heard of that happening with, uh, with Japanese. Where did you go after Biak? After Biak, I went to the uh, island of Mindoro in the Philippines, and uh, the day that uh, I was flying again in a C-47 to Mindoro was the uh, day that uh, President Roosevelt died. And uh, when we were up in the air, the co-pilot came back to inform us, inform us that he had passed away. Could you tell me more about that day, how you all felt? Well, we felt uh, sad. Of course, we knew he had been ailing for uh, quite some time. And uh, so it wasn't uh, a complete surprise. Uh, but I, I guess uh, also everybody had hoped and assumed that he would live throughout the war. And we were getting close to the end at that point in time. Of course, we didn't quite realize that we were close to the end in April 1945. Uh, the war in Europe, of course, ended in May 1945. But uh, it, was a, it was sad news, definite sad news. How, uh, how did your job as a radio operator change throughout your career? Well, during uh, our time on BIAC, uh, and in my diary, again, I discovered that it was in January of 1945, uh, radio teletype was uh, being talked about. And uh, the teletype, when it was developed, when it, when it was in place on the island of Biak, uh, replaced 
the previous way of sending and receiving messages. Uh, we no longer had to use a semi-automatic key. In receiving messages, uh, the teletype machine did, uh, did the whole thing. The other end, they'd type it uh, into the machine, and the machine at our end uh, receiving a message would, would take it, and all we'd have to do is pull the paper out of the machine, and you had your message. Yeah. In sending a mes message, of course, you had to sit at the machine and type it out. So this was really different. It changed the type of work. Uh, the work uh, was much more efficient. Uh, with this uh, improvement and uh, we had more than enough uh, radio operators uh, suddenly. This change took place when you <laughs> went to Mindoro, would you say? Or? Uh, yes, it changed. Right. Uh, the change started taking place in, in January uh, or February of uh, 1945 and February and March and uh, I was getting antsy. Uh, you know, we were working uh, at that point in time, we were working something like six hours on, 30 hours off, and uh, I, I didn't feel uh, quite as uh, valuable as I had earlier. But uh, when I got to Mindoro, uh, and the reason uh, uh, reason I went there, I suppose, was because they needed uh, radio operators, and they never did get teletype machines uh, on Mindoro. Oh. Where I was working, not yeah. where I was working anyway. Is Mandoro in the Philippines? Yes, it's the island uh, right below Luzon. And what was that like in terms of exposure to to uh, hardship and, and combat? Well, it was a lot more civilized uh, in Mandoro. <laughs> New Guinea uh, is very, very rustic. Uh, uh, the, the natives uh, are uh, uh, not uh, well educated, whereas the Philippines are way ahead uh, in that respect at that point in time. And uh, uh, we had a houseboy in uh, Mindoro who would clean our tent and uh, do anything we asked him to do in the way of uh, working and cooking and stuff like that. So it was, uh, and, the, and the people, there were a lot of Filipinos who talk very good English, you could communicate with them, you get acquainted with the natives there, whereas in, uh, in Biak, I don't recall ever getting acquainted with uh, anyone but uh, a young fellow who showed me the graves of his parents. They'd, they'd bury their uh, dead in caves, uh -huh. and so they uh, knew where they were at all times. He took me into the cave and showed me the, where the bones were. That was uh, that was in New Guinea, but uh, it was hard to communicate because they they did not learn the English language, but you communicate with signs and whatnot. Were the uh, Japanese uh, attacking Americans on Mindoro? Uh, no, the war had moved uh, north, okay. and uh, there was uh, some uh, sporadic fighting going on in Luzon. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a friend. Uh, on the island of Biak, who had talked about it in my diary quite a bit during that uh, that month, and he and I were spent uh, a few weeks in the hospital together. I got got acquainted with him there. But his name was Bernard Dems, mm -hmm. and he was from Syracuse, New York. Uh, he was uh, very much involved in uh, combat with a 32nd uh, division, and. Uh, in January of 45, when we, and, and December of 44, when we spent time in the hospital together, we got acquainted at that time, became good friends, and uh, I got out of the hospital before he did. And then he was assigned to a, a casual camp to await transportation to get back to his outfit. Uh, actually, then he came to live with us in our tent and he wasn't getting his orders, so uh, uh, he was uh, uh, enjoying his uh, extended vacation even after he was in the hospital. So he stayed with us uh, for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he did get his uh, orders and got a flight, first he got his orders, but then he had to get a flight. He had to wait for that. Um, when he got his flight, uh, 
he then left and uh, I heard from him he was uh, in Luzon in the thick of it at that time when they had to recapture uh, Luzon. There was a lot of uh, fierce fighting going on north of uh, Manila. Now the thing about uh, Bernard Dems that uh, uh, is of interest also is, by the way, here's uh, what he gave me at that time. Was a, he had picked this up from a uh, Japanese officer, a lieutenant. I don't know if that's first lieutenant or second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But he gave it to me before he left. And I said, I don't want it. Uh, uh, you know, that's yours. Uh, you picked that up. He said, I've got enough stuff, uh, so why don't you keep it? So I said, well, I'll get it to you after the war. That will give me an excuse to look you up sometime after the war. Well, finally, I tried to look him up uh, about three, four years ago. And we were going through Syracuse. and. Uh, on our way to Minnesota, of course. And usually we drove as far as Rochester the first day. But this time I uh, uh, got my wife to agree with me to stop at Syracuse, to get a motel at Syracuse, so I could learn, uh, look up uh, Bernard Dems. And I found him in the phone book. I didn't find him at the same address, but I found the name Dems. And I got some of his relatives, and they uh, one one cousin referred me to another, and uh, finally I got referred to his sister. And we talked about him, and they said he never came back. So oh. what had happened was that when he got up there north of Luzon, uh, okay. uh, he got killed. Oh. And that's the sad end of uh, uh, that, uh, that particular story. You mentioned that you were in the hospital. May I ask what you were in the hospital for? Well, way back in Oro Bay, I had, uh, when I first got over there uh, in mid-July uh, of 1944, uh, I had been swimming in the river a few times. And on this occasion, uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Snedeker and I went skinny dipping. And, and uh, we climbed up on a stump and we dove into the river. Well, this, this particular time, I hit my head on a rock on the bottom and uh, Joe rescued me out of the river and uh, got me to a hospital, which was walking range. So we walked to the hospital, but uh, I was bleeding uh, very badly and uh, it's right here on my head. You can uh, just barely see the scar. Uh, but when I, when I was in the hospital that time, it was, uh, it was about three weeks. And they cleaned out the wound, and the doctor said he didn't want to scrape uh, too deeply because uh, he'd, uh, <laughs> it was a dangerous area in my head. So uh, he cleaned it out as best he could. And, uh, and in three weeks, I was out. And uh, then within a week, I was on my way to uh, Biak. But uh, what I missed out on that time was my outfit that I had been in uh, got moved to Hollandia, which was a staging area for the invasion of a uh, lady. Mm -hmm. And so the outfit I had been in, been in uh, uh, with went to lady, but I was in the hospital, so I got taken out of the outfit, mm -hmm. and then I was a replacement when I got out of the hospital, and I got sent to Biak instead. So this uh, happened before Biak? Uh, yes, this happened on, in Oro Bay in the Zambezi River. And it happened because uh, the time of the day that I dove in the river, it was low tide. Mm -hmm. And the times before when I had been swimming and diving off the stump up the bank, uh, it had been high tide. It was perfectly safe. But I didn't, uh, I didn't know about high tides or low tides mm -hmm. because I was from a farm <laughs> in Minnesota. I, Where is the Zambezi River? It's uh, right at Oro Bay. Where is uh, that? Off uh, New Guinea. Oh, OK, so uh, that's in New Guinea. And uh, the Battle of Buna, which was a famous battle, was fought uh, at Oro Bay in that same area. Now, Oro Bay is north of Milne Bay. Milne Bay is north of uh, uh, whatever that city is at the southern, southern part of New Guinea. I forget mm -hmm. what it is. but it's. It's not too far from uh, Australia. After you were in the Mandora, the Philippines, did you have any other overseas duties? 
before you returned home? No, no. I was there when the, when the war ended. And could you tell me how you heard about the end of the war? <clears throat> well, we were up to date uh, on the news uh, every day. We knew about the war ending in uh, Europe. And uh, uh, we knew about the bobs being dropped the same day they were dropped on August 6th and mm -hmm. August 9th, the atom bombs, that is. Uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. So uh, we knew that was happening, but it was uh, none of us. None of, none of us felt that uh, this was going to end the war. We uh, we thought the Japanese uh, would keep on fighting because they had no uh, indications uh, that they would ever ever give up mm -hmm. or ever surrender. So. It was a surprise, even after the dropping of the bombs, that they did finally surrender. So did you all celebrate when you heard? Oh, sure, we celebrated, and uh, everybody started counting their points uh, because we were being sent home according to a point system, uh, and the people who had been over longer had earned more points. Uh, than uh, than the recruits who came along uh, later, and I was kind of in between there someplace. So the war ended in August. Uh, I got on a boat uh, in late November to come home. Throughout the war, uh, what was your R and R like? I don't recall that we ever had any R and R in any official sense, but uh, I do read in my diary that we played. Uh, basketball mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we played catch. Uh, <laughs> we must have had a, some other kind of a ball to play catch with, but uh, uh, basketball was, uh, we, we played quite a number of games and uh, played against the outfit uh, next door and had a lot of fun doing that. Now, there's a little competition. <laughs> I suppose uh, the good sound system will pick that up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, when I got to Bidoro, uh, we had a lot more sporting activities. Uh, our message center was located right next to uh, a sugar plantation owner's uh, mansion, is what I called it. But the uh, Army brass had taken it over, so they were living there. And there was a swimming pool there. They allowed us to use the pool. Once in a while, there were tennis courts about a half a mile away, so we were able to play tennis. And we, uh, we uh, tried to find activities. In fact, uh, every place I was at uh, overseas, uh, and, and my diary really brings this out, is uh, life was uh, boring. Mm -hmm. Quite uh, often from day to day, we were looking for things to do. We played card games, you know, we, uh, we went to movies, and at uh, a point in time we had uh, a couple dozen uh, movie theaters on the island of Biak, so that if you didn't uh, see a movie on one particular movie place, uh, you could catch it at another. So you got to see every movie that came along, and we went to a lot of movies, read a lot of books. Uh, I even st uh, was doing studying on uh, bookkeeping and uh, and math and uh, something else. I had a friend there who had uh, uh, acquired material to use for uh, for studying, and I, at one point, was that ambitious, thinking if I do enough of these courses, I could really reduce the time I'd have to be in college later on. Wow. Did you have mm -hmm. any uh, U.S. show U.S.O. shows come to your areas? Yes, uh, yeah. yes, we had some very good ones. We had uh, Jack Betty, Carol Landis, uh, Larry Adler was a harmonica player. Uh, the fellow with the bulgy guys, I could never remember his Larry name. Larry Colonna or Corona? Jerry. Jerry Corona. Corona. Yeah. Jerry Colonna. Yeah. Uh, he was there. How, wh um, what was Jack Benny like? Was he good? Oh, he was very good, yeah. very, very entertaining. And you know, uh, everybody had uh, heard him on the radio. I'm sure prior to the war, so so uh, that was uh, great. And uh, Carol Landis uh, danced and uh, sang and told jokes. And uh, she, actually, she was uh, so beautiful, you know, she wouldn't have had to do anything. Just to look at her was great. Yeah. <laughs>
I forgot to ask you if you remember the names of the movies you saw. Uh, I have written some of them in the diary, yeah. but right at the moment yeah. I can't uh, recite any. And I, I remember in the diary I wrote down the names of books that uh, uh, I read. One movie I can remember, Young Mr. Ames, yeah. uh, comes to mind right at the moment. Did you have a chance to um, work alongside any of our allies? We uh, saw Australians uh, mm -hmm. in New Guinea from time to time. And at that point in time, as I recall, they were manning uh, tiny outposts here and there in the, in the jungle and had been doing that uh, even before the Americans were there to uh, know about the activities uh, of the Japanese. Uh, the Australians, one or two would uh, be hiding in the jungle and uh, they had, uh, of course, radio equipment to uh, uh, have communication back with the mainland in uh, Australia, but uh, they were always studying the positions of the Japanese armies and where they were going and uh, what the movement uh, was going on. So they were doing a bang-up job of uh, that type of work, very dangerous work. But it's, it's amazing they could be surrounded by Japanese and still survive. Mm. What was your rank throughout the war? Well, I started out as a private. I was a private uh, quite a while. Uh, finally, uh, by act of Congress, I became a PFC. <laughs> it was uh, ruled that uh, if you had been overseas for a certain period of time, automatically got an increase to uh, PFC. Well, after that, uh, then it was a fairly short period of time. Um, I got a T5 uh, ranking technician, fifth grade, uh, uh, and then uh, T, uh, T4, which is a sergeant, mm -hmm. technician, fourth grade uh, sergeant. And that's what I was when I was discharged. How do you feel uh do you, do you feel that the officers gave you good leadership? Well, I think in general uh, they did. Uh, there was an officer named Colonel Stuffy Smith at the fifth uh, replacement depot uh, at Oro Bay, who had quite a uh, quite a negative reputation. We all heard about uh, heard about that. But I could question whether he did good leadership or not. He, he ran the place and uh, he ran it strictly and I suppose that's what he, uh, he had to do. But uh, as far as most of the officers, I, uh, I, I thought they were uh, good people and did a good job and uh, uh, they tried to, in fact, uh, when I was on BIAC, I, I went to our commanding officer there in uh, uh, February or March uh, to ask for uh, a transfer because it was obvious uh, they had more than enough radio operators mm -hmm. and teletype had come in. And so I asked for a transfer. Uh, I was uh, thinking I uh, wanted to be where the action was uh, and the war hadn't moved uh, north. So uh, he put it in and uh, when he uh, got a request for personnel of uh, my, uh, my type of training, uh, that's how I got to Mindoro. Mm -hmm. uh, moving ahead again to the end of the war, could you tell me um, how you were, did you uh, fly home or go home by boat? I came home by boat. And what and was the boat trip like? Uh, prior to the boat trip, I was in the hospital for uh, dysentery. Mm -hmm. And while I was overseas, I was in the hospital initially with the head injury, then the second time for about uh, almost a month, uh, again with the follow-up on the head injury, and then the, just before we came home with the dysentery, and that dysentery was no fun <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, but uh, the guys in my outfit were visiting me at the hospital, and they said we're going to leave in two days, uh, and so they were getting everything in ready, and the doctor was telling me you're in no shape to go anyplace. Uh, so I was uh, 
between a rock and a hard place there for, for a while, but I, I got word back to our commanding officer and uh, I got his ear and wrote him a note, I believe, and uh, convinced him uh, to ask my doctor uh, if I couldn't go with him. And I, uh, I told him, I think I told him my doctor was rather conservative in his medical judgment. <laughs> But uh, then I talked to my doctor, of course, uh, as long as I could, as long as he listened. And finally, uh, he said, okay, okay, reluctantly, I'll, uh, I'll let you go. But uh, it's against my better judgment. But I wanted to get home, you know. I oh, didn't yeah. want, want to lay around there anymore. So when and where were you discharged? I was discharged at Camp McCoy, uh, Wisconsin, on January 5, 1946. This was... Uh, after uh, uh, coming in, uh, coming back on an uh, APA boat, APA or ATA, I'm not sure which it is. It's an Army transport, so it must be ATA. We came into San Pedro Harbor, uh, Los Angeles, and we had a very good uh, reception uh, there. In fact, before we even docked, there were little tugs uh, on the side of the ship with an orchestra on it, playing beautiful music. And uh, I remember the headline in the newspapers was something about Gene Crane uh, had made a great movie of some kind. And so she was in the headlines. But when we got to uh, our uh, barracks, uh, we I'm not sure if we even slept there. If we did, it was, uh, it was just a matter of a few hours before they got us on a train. Uh, but we did get fed. We got fed very, very well. We had uh, steak, we had milk, we had German prisoners of war waiting on us on a one-on-one -on -one basis so uh, we could get anything we wanted to. And I could still remember how wonderful it was just to drink milk because mm -hmm. we didn't have much milk overseas. In fact, the food was not all that uh, great. Uh, and, the, and the steak, of course, and everything else that went with it uh, was, was certainly something. I, and and I, then, I, then I got a train and came across uh, from Los Angeles uh, to Camp Bicoy, Wisconsin, got discharged there. And what was the feeling, what were the feelings of your family and friends when you returned? Oh, they were uh, very happy to see me come back in one piece. <laughs> uh, in spite of the the head injury, and of course the head injury wasn't uh, really a factor until 1975, in my older age, when it started uh, bothering me. And you could probably tell the way I sit, you know, and I stiffen up, and I, I yeah. should be doing exercises right now to be able to sit oh. a, another hour. We go another hour. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it was it was great to get back, and uh, I had an uncle in Minneapolis, and he uh, uh, made his home available to me, uh, and I lived with him uh, before I started uh, college. How important uh, was serving in the military for you? Well, it was uh, crucial, I suppose. Uh, because uh, had I stayed in high school, I did finish high school before I went into the military, um, but uh, I'm not sure I would have ever gone to college if I didn't have the GI Bill, and uh, I used up every bit of eligibility I had for the GI Bill. That was six years of college, four years undergraduate, and, uh, two years of graduate study. So uh, that set me on course uh, for the rest of my life. And what did you study? Uh, I studied uh, sociology and psychology in uh, undergraduate mm -hmm. business administration. And uh, then uh, in, uh, I got a master's degree in uh, social work, University of Pennsylvania in 1953. Mm -hmm. And after that I went to work back in Minnesota because uh, I was financed in part by the state of Minnesota and I owed them uh, three years of work after uh, I got the degree. Mm -hmm. So that I worked in uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Actually, I, uh, I worked there for about seven years. So I uh, paid back double of what 
uh, I was contracted for. And then I was in Omaha, Nebraska for five and a half years. Uh, I was a social services director at Douglas County Welfare in Omaha. And, and then I got recruited by the Health Education Welfare in uh, Chicago and uh, was there two and a half years and I got a promotion to come to Boston and I finished up my career with 17 years in, uh, in Boston. Mm. <clears throat> How do you feel about the difference in public opinion regarding uh, vet uh, toward veterans from World War II versus uh, Vietnam? Well, I've come to terms with the differences. I, I think uh, uh, World War Two, I suppose World War One, Two were more glorious wars <laughs> than the others. Uh, uh, so uh, we were, uh, we had God on our side during those uh, encounters. Uh, I'm not sure you could say the same for uh, the Korean and the Vietnamese war. In fact, in the Vietnamese uh, war, I had uh, a difference of opinion with my son because. Uh, my father was in uh, World War I. Uh, my uncle had military service uh, in the Army uh, during peacetime in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a brother-in-law who was a prisoner of war in Japan for uh, 40 months. And all of this indicated, you know, we had family background in the military. When it came to the Vietnam War, my son said he did not want to go. and. Uh, Actually, it turned out he never did get drafted, so he didn't have to go. But we had a difference of opinion on that, and uh, it took me 10 or 20 years before I finally uh, agreed with him that uh, uh, you did the right thing. Uh, he would have, he would have, if it had to be, he would probably have been a conscientious objector. So you changed your mind over the years. I sure did on that one. I, I don't think we should have ever been involved in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And some of these skirmishes that take place uh, nowadays too, you know, they, some of them have been going on for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, not going to be easy to change those enmities that have grown mm -hmm. up over such a long period of time. Did you join the reserves after you returned? No, I haven't. Uh, joined uh, hardly anything. Right now I'm uh, joining the Veterans Administration. I'm going to get a card from them and I have to go to the Veterans Administration Hospital to get my picture taken. I guess I've gone through all the application process that I'll have a card and then I can go into any VA medical facility and, uh, and get treatment. You know one thing that we uh, you mentioned before and I thought it'd be a good time to do is a poem that you brought in, and I would love to hear you read, called Ode to New Guinea. Could you tell me about it? Uh, I did not write this poem. Mm -hmm. uh, this was passed around from uh, uh, somebody to somebody, but uh, it's kind of interesting, and I have another poem there. I'll, I'd like to probably read just excerpts out of, the, out of that one. But this is called Ode to New Guinea. I noticed it's on American Red Cross paper. <laughs> I really love New Guinea. It grows on me each day. And when the war is over, I think I'm going to stay. <laughs> you could have your fast cities and your fast, exciting life. Give me a peaceful jungle and a fuzzy, wuzzy wife. <laughs> I'm tired of fancy living. This is the life you see. If you were on this wondrous isle, I'm sure you would agree. A thatched hut by the ocean, beneath a tall palm tree. I'd laugh and joke and sit and smoke, and how contented I would be. I wouldn't have any more khaki, I'd wear a bright sarong, and wouldn't get tan out on the sand, this is where I belong. I cannot tell you more just now, you will really have to wait. The doctor just walked in and said, here is your section eight. <laughs> now section eight means, uh, uh, Mental problem. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the other one? I yes, can, I'd love to hear the other I'll one. I'll just too. give a sample of yeah. this one in case there's ever any uh, <laughs> other guys who are do getting in there watching this uh, video. Uh, they may have uh, seen this sometime or other or might remind them of it. 
but it's quite long, so I won't uh, read the whole thing. But this one is, in, uh, I didn't write this one either. Uh, it, it's entitled, uh, Somewhere in New Guinea. We're somewhere in New Guinea where the sun is like a curse, and each long day is followed by another slightly worse. Where the brick red dust blows thicker than the shifting desert sand, and all men dream and wish for is a fair and greener land. We're somewhere in New Guinea where the nights were made for love, where the moon is like a searchlight in the starlit skies above. Where, were it not for duty, it could be a great delight, but it's a shameless waste of beauty, for there's not a girl in sight. <laughs> we're somewhere in New Guinea where the ants and lizards play, and a hundred new mosquitoes replace each one you slay. <laughs> so take me back to the USA, there always let me dwell, for this God-forsaken island is a substitute for hell. <laughs> That's great. Some GI stayed up nights to write those. <laughs> <laughs> Is there um, any other things that I failed to ask you that you would like to talk about in terms of your war experiences? Well, let's see. What, uh, I think I talked about uh, Bernard Dems, yes. so we won't repeat yeah. that. Uh, but there was a question um, on the format uh, where I filled out. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the questions was, did you make any lasting friendships? Yes. Well, and generally, uh, uh, yes and no. There were a lot of friendships uh, that were friendships for that period of time. And uh, that we all scattered to different places and uh, never see each other again. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, there is at least one lasting friendship. Uh, it's a person by the name of uh, Owen Moore who lives in Tucson, Arizona, and I spent uh, I spent quite a bit of time down there in the in the winter time. Mm -hmm. He and I met uh, in February of 1943 when we were assigned uh, to East High School in Minneapolis for uh, radio repair training, mm -hmm. and uh, we were there about six months uh, for that type of training. He got me started playing tennis in the spring of that year. And uh, we kept in touch during the war. In fact, he was at Camp Kohler when I was at Camp Kohler in California, so we saw each other there. But then uh, we went different directions because I went into radio operator training and he went into uh, a type of work, uh, video work. Uh, sound. He, he was a specialist uh, with uh, working on the soundtrack for making films and uh, that type of work. So he went, he was sent to New York City and he was in uh, a school there and it sounded interesting because he said there were some uh, movie people there who had worked in the movies in Hollywood and New York City uh, who also were in the military and uh, who were uh, heading up some of those uh, particular uh, type teams. Uh, so he was a photographer and a sound man in, uh, in uh, making that type of stuff. But he got set to uh, Ceylon off the southern coast of India, Sri Lanka. Mm. Ceylon has changed its name to Sri Lanka, mm. is what it is now. So we kept in touch uh, during the war and uh, of course, after the war, he was in uh, Minneapolis, and I was in Minneapolis going to college, so we were uh, close friends, and we always uh, stuck together because we were playing tennis together. Uh, and so we continued doing that. I can't wait to get there next month uh -huh. to uh, play some more tennis. <laughs> and of course, nowadays it's doubles rather than singles, but it used to be singles, and there was a period of 20 years where he was always beating me, and finally I caught up to him and started beating him for a period a short period of time, so we've had a lot of, a lot of fun together, and uh, uh, we uh, see each other quite a bit uh, now too, and we stay in touch. And uh, I, I told him about this uh, video, and I'm sure he's sitting on the edge of his chair waiting <laughs> for me to get down there with the video so he could see it. <laughs> Is there so. a, um, one thought or memory you'd like to share uh, with the community? about uh, your experiences in the war or your thoughts on the war? 
Well, one thought is in respect to the dropping of the atom bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time that uh, it was done, we were all cheering on the island of Mindoro. We were very uh, uh, pleased that they were coming through the weapon of this nature at that time and uh, uh, hoping that it would be uh, successful. So uh, um, uh, at that time, we were 100% in favor of dropping of the bombs and 55 years has passed since then and I'm, I'm still fully in favor of having those bombs dropped because it got us home for one thing and maybe some people would say, well, that's selfish. but. Uh, you know, you want to stay alive as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And had we had to invade Japan, that could have been a holocaust of one kind or another. It would have cost millions, uh, I think it would have cost millions of lives. And uh, Lord knows we had uh, plenty of lives lost during uh, mm -hmm. World War II, civilians uh, in Europe and in Asia and GIs all over the world. You start adding up some of those numbers, and they're tremendous uh, cost of lives to have a war like that. Mm -hmm. So you end that, mm -hmm. you really have to work toward a ending to that war and staying out of future mm -hmm. wars because you'd have uh, more and more people killed, and it's, uh, it's a very s uh, sad situation. It's a uh, war is a slaughter of uh, human beings. Do you agree with Truman that we ultimately even saved more Japanese lives by dropping the bomb? Yes, I think, uh, I think that's certainly true. And I, uh, I think if, had we not dropped the bombs, uh, they certainly would have kept uh, fighting. They didn't surrender very, very uh, often right. on uh, any basis, on any terms. And the Japanese military, even after dropping the bombs, certainly were not in favor of uh, surrendering. It had to be the civilian leadership that uh, took charge to, uh, to surrender. Are any other thoughts you'd like to share before we uh, close up the interview? Hmm. No, I can't think okay. of any. I think we've covered it enough. Yeah, we, we must have, have gone for uh, <laughs> an hour or so. Uh, yes. I want to uh, thank you so there much. Is a, there is a yes. book I should mention. Oh, I should yes, mention. we should mention this book. I brought the book with me, so I need to mention okay. it. It's, uh, it's a book called Voices. It's uh, Letters from World War II by Ken Schomburg, uh -huh. S-C-H-A-M-B-E-R-G. And uh, each page has about uh, three, two or three different letters written by different GIs uh, all over the world uh, relating their World War II experiences. Uh, it's in a way it's like reading a dictionary because it isn't a continuous story from start to finish but it's uh, each of these uh, stories are very interesting and there's uh, some other uh, GIs who are making these videos here in Natick uh, who are in here. One of them is uh, Donald Chase from uh -huh. uh, Framingham and when I read his story in here, I picked up the phone and gave him a call and had a nice conversation <laughs> with him about his experiences crossing the Rhine River in uh, Germany. And Donald Chase has made one of these videos, and I'm looking forward to checking it out from the library and seeing it. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming in today and sharing your thoughts and memories with us. You're certainly welcome. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. The red light is still on. Stay on for a few minutes. All right. I'll get out of here then. <laughs>